Hello, thank you so much for tuning into my YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a simple tutorial on how to use neural networks for regression problems. I'm going to be also talking about k-fold validation and how we could code them. Let's get started. As I said in this video, I want to talk about how to use neural networks for regression problems. Another common type of machine learning problem is regression, which consists of predicting a continuous value instead of a discrete label. For instance, predicting the temperature tomorrow given meteorological data, or predicting the time that a software project will take to complete given its specifications. So as you can see in regression, we are predicting continuous values as opposed to a discrete label that we did in classifications. In this problem, you'll attempt to predict the median price of homes in a given Boston suburb in the mid-70s, given data points about the suburb at the time, such as the crime rate, the local property tax rate, and so on. The data set you'll use has relatively few data points, only 506 split between 404 training samples and 102 test samples and each feature in the input data, for example the crime rate, has a, a different scale. For instance, some values are proportions which take values between 0 and 1, and others take values between 1 and 12, others between 1 and 100, and so on. Let's look at the data. Okay, let's look at the data. From CRASS data. Here is the data. Let's run this part. Now let's look at the train data shape. The new code. And also the test data shape. As you can see, you have 404 training samples and 102 test samples, each with 30 numerical features, such as per capita crime rate, average number of room per dwelling, accessibility to highways, and so on. The targets are the median values of the owner-occupied homes in thousands of dollars. So, train target. The prices are typically between 10000 and 50000 If that sounds very cheap, remember that this was the mid-70s, and these prices aren't adjusted for inflation. The next step is to prepare the data. It would be problematic to fit into a neural network values that all take widely different ranges. The network might be able to automatically adapt to such heterogeneous data, but it would definitely make learning more difficult. A widespread best practice to deal with such data is to do feature-wise normalization. For each feature in the input data, a column in the input data matrix, you subtract the mean of the feature and divide by the standard deviation so that the feature is centered around zero and has a unit standard deviation. This is easily done in NumPy. So we open new code and we write mean. Note that the quantities used for normalizing the test data are computed using the training data. You should never use in your workflow any quantity computed on the test data, even for something as simple as data normalization. Let's run this. So now the data are normalized. Because so few samples are available, you'll use a very small network with two hidden layers, each with 64 units. In general, the less training data you have, the worse overfitting will be. And using a small network is one way to mitigate overfitting. Open a new code from Keras. So the network ends with a single unit and no activation. It will be a linear layer. This is a typical setup for a scalar regression, a regression where you're trying to predict a single continuous value. Applying an activation function would constrain the range the output can take. For instance, if you apply the sigmoid activation function to the last layer, the network could only learn to predict values between 0 and 1. Here, because the last layer is purely linear, the network is free to learn to predict values in any range. Note that you compile the network with the MSC loss function, mean squared error, the square of the difference between the predictions and the targets. This is a widely used loss function for regression problems. 
You're also monitoring a new metric during training, mean absolute error, MAE. It's the absolute value of the difference between the predictions and the targets. For instance, an MAE of 0.5 on this problem would mean your predictions are off by $500 on average. Now, to evaluate your network while you keep adjusting its parameters, such as the number of epochs used for training and so on, you could split the data into a training set and a validation set. But because you have so few data points, the validation set would end up being very small, for instance, about 100 examples. As a consequence, the validation scores might change a lot depending on which data points you chose to use for validation and which you chose for training. The validation scores might have a high variance with regard to the validation split. This would prevent you from reliably evaluating your model. The best practice in such situation is to use k fold cross-validation. It consists of splitting the available data into k partitions. Typically, k is equal to 4 or 5. Instantiating k identical models and training each one on k minus 1 partitions while evaluating on the remaining partition. The validation score for the model used is then the average of the k validation scores obtained. In terms of code, this is straightforward. Okay, here's the code for that. And we're going to do it for 100 epochs. Let's run it. As you can see, it's being run. Okay, the training is done. Let's look at all the scores. Now let's look at the average of all the scores. Now let's try training the network a bit longer, like for 500 epochs, to keep a record of how well the model does at each epoch. We'll modify the training loop to save the per epoch validation score log. Okay, here it is. Let's run this part. It may take some time because it's 500 epochs. Okay, the run for 500 epoch is over. Now we can compute the average of the per epoch MAE scores for all the folds. Let's open a new coding part. Let's run this. Now let's plot this. A new code again. Let's run it again. It may be a little difficult to see the plot due to the scaling issues and relatively high variance. Okay, let's do the following. We omit the first 10 data points, which are on a different scale than the rest of the curve. And then we replace each point with an exponential moving average of the previous points to obtain a smooth curve, which is done shown as here. Let's run this. According to this plot, validation MAE stops improving significantly after 80 epochs, as you can see here. Past that point, you start overfitting. Once you're finished tuning all the parameters of the model in addition to the number of epochs, you could also adjust the size of the hidden layers. You can train a final production model on all the training data with the best parameters, and then look at its performance on the data set. Okay, let's open a new one. Let's train and then evaluate it. We're only using number of epochs 80 because we found out that 80 is enough. Let's have a look at the final result, which shows that we're still off by about $2,660. And that's about it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you were able to learn something useful from this video. I would appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel and also share the video with your friends. Thank you so much and have a nice day.